um, Claire is going to tell us a little bit more about uh, the results of one of the bait sprays that we were using uh, and how it's become a commercial product. Good afternoon, Claire. Good afternoon. Can you hear me, Scott? We can hear you perfectly. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we can now see you fine. So if you want to share your presentation with us, Claire. Can you see my screen? I can indeed. Do you want to hit the uh, slide? Oops, come back. Does so that look right? That's perfect. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Scott, for inviting me to your meeting. And I'm going to talk about ProBands, which is a cost-effective adjuvant for the management of spotted wing drosophila. I'm Claire Sampson, and I'm from Russell IPM. Now, I see that Adam's doing a talk later on SWD monitoring and management, so I won't go into the detail, but I think enough to say that all the efforts that GROWEGS are going into with uh, trapping, monitoring, netting, biocontrol, tight picking, hygiene, spraying, uh, it can cost an awful lot. So up to three, over 3,000 pounds per hectare sometimes. So we're looking for improved methods. Um, and so this is where we've come up with ProBands. So what is ProBands? ProBands is a food bait adjuvant. It's approved for use in the UK. And it's approved for use with all plant protection products on, that are on label or with EMU authorizations. Um, you're not allowed to use more than 50% of the maximum approved insecticide rate with the bait, but we're actually re recommending 4% of the full recommended rate. And we're recommending it, it is used as a ban treatment, which reduces the costs and also the reduces the impact on natural enemies. We've tested it in strawberry, raspberry, and cherry. Uh, it's not going to my next slide. Let's try again. Um, so how does it work? ProBands is a phago stimulant. So it stimulates SWD into feeding. So SWD attracted to ProBands, they start feeding. And by doing that, they're taking up actually a, a higher proportion of the insecticide and they, they die much more rapidly. So it's a better way of uh, targeting the insect than trying to hit them with a small droplet when you spray. I'm gonna share with you two trials that were done within the project. So the first one is semi skip field scale trials done at NIAB EMR in strawberry. So by doing it at NIAB, NIAB carried out the trials and by doing it there, you can have these nice control tunnels and release SWD. Um, so you can get nice high numbers of SWD. The treatments we tested were untreated control, full rate foliar sprays of tracer and x -ray. So that's a spray volume of 500 litres per hectare, you're covering all of the foliage top and bottom. Comparing that and comparing that to the third treatment, which was the ProBands, which is a 5% volume, two litres per hectare, but with reduced rates of insecticide. So with Tracer and x -ray, but only using 4% of the maximum recommended rate and a lower spray volume. So 400 litres per hectare rather than the 500. At the beginning of the trial, spotted wing drosophila SWD were released for two weeks, and then that was followed by sprays on weekly intervals, uh, alternating tracer and XRL for, uh, for the other two treatments. Um, and then to assess how effective it was, we collected fruit, and they were put in these uh, flute, float, fruit flotation tests, so 20 fruit were put into these sugar solutions. And you can see in the top, the SWD larvae float to the top and can be counted. So there's the larvae in higher magnification. And the results of this, so in the green there, so this is average numbers of larvae per 20 fruit. And in the green there is the untreated. So it's a dip that just reflects the generational effect from you know, released populations. Um, but you can see with the full rate insecticide in purple and the ProBands treatment, the band treatment with 4% of the full rate, they're not significantly different. 
Um, overall, 77% reduction in SWD larvae with the full rate and 80% reduction with the 4% rate, but that's not significantly different. So both worked equally well. And then moving on to the trial in raspberry. So from these controlled uh, tunnels at NIAB, uh, we moved into a commercial crop. So we couldn't have an untreated control and release SWD for obvious reasons. So the two treat, we just compared two treatments again with four replicate plots for the uh, full folio treatment. We had six for the pro bands and comparing the full folio spray with full rate tracer and XRL. We had the pro bands, 5% volume, that's two liters per hectare, uh, tracer and XRL with 4% the insecticide rate in a band treatment. So you can see the spraying here is doing a band, uh, one meter, you know, the spray about one meter band just below the flowers and fruits. Naturally occurring spotted wing drosophila populations, spraying at weekly intervals. Um, and again, doing the flotation test to find out the results. Uh, and before I show you the results, uh, a couple of slides here on how you mix and apply probands. So probands is quite a viscous liquid. Um, so the dissolving in water is temperature dependent, but it's, quite, it's very easy to dissolve at room temperature. Um, so at 20 degrees, you just mix it in within three, me three minutes, it's completely mixed within the water, but you probably don't want to put it in a freezing cold a bucket of uh, icy, icy water early in the season. Um, and the warmer it gets, the quicker it dissolves. And in terms of applying it, so instead of looking for nice fine droplets to cover the whole crop, we're looking at a larger droplet size so that the SWD are attracted to the droplets and feed on it. So we're effectively doubling the droplet size, you can see there. And the way we're doing that is to use these, other, no, other nozzles could be used, but in our case, we use the Leckler nozzle, uh, you see with a flat fan here, compared to the hollow cone for the full treatment. And as I said, for the bait, we did a one meter band rather than trying to spray the whole canopy. And the volume of water 40 versus 500. And again, we use, 4% the full rate, so 8 mils rather than 200 for Tracer and 36 compared to 900 for XRL. So moving on to the results. So again, equal to the previous trial, really not significantly different. If anything, the probands with 4% rate is slightly better, but statistically not significantly different. So you're getting equal control, um, at much lower insecticide rates. So I should say the concentration of the spray is not necessarily different, depends on what you use, but the volume of spray is reduced. And here's a picture of the bait application. So you could see larger droplet size compared to the standard spray. And because we're doing it in a, brand, a band, immediately after we were getting the bees coming out onto the flowers straight after spraying, which was nice to see. So in summary of the benefits, the band application of the insecticide were equally effective as using a full rate. And that gave us, at the rate we used, was 96% reduction in insecticide rate. rate. And if you work out the costs of the active ingredients, so you've got to buy the probands, but you're using much less insecticides and it reduced the um, cost of the active ingredients by about 50% um, using that rate that we're recommending the 4%. And uh, Ralph Noble did some tests of uh, residues in the fruit and not surprisingly, you've got 11 times more pesticide residues in the fruit with the full rate compared to the bait sprays. Um, obviously because you're not hitting the fruit with the bait spray so much. And also eight times less spray with the bait compared to the full spray. And what does this mean? It meant to take 15% less time to apply. So you're saving on both fuel and labor costs that wasn't taken into account by this 50% reduction in cost. So your actual costs overall are, are even better than that. 
Um, and so using the band treatment, the proband bait sprays reduce the grower's costs, reduce the environmental impact of pesticides, yet can achieve equal or better spotted wing drosophila control. We're recommending you begin applications as soon as you, uh, the monitoring traps indicate the presence of SWD. For tree fruit, as that's the audience, we're, it's four litres of probands in 80 litres of insecticide mix in a two metre band for cherry. Premix it in warm water before adding to the spray tank. It's completely safe, uh, non toxic. And using the band re rate with 4% the insecticide rate, equally effective as the full rate. But statutory, you must not exceed 50% of the full insecticide rate. So anyway, you need to reduce it, but you, you can if effectively reduce it to as low as 4% and still get very good control. Um, so um, for information on prices, orders, et cetera, et cetera, we have a new, I have a new colleague, I'm very pleased to say, started at Russell IPM this year, Andy Russell, technical sales manager, and those are his contact details. So please get in contact with um, Andy if you want further information and um, or to the Russell IPM um, help desk either can help. Um, most importantly, I want to thank all the people who've been involved in the, war, in the work. So it was, was part of a wider Innovate UK where we were also looking at biopesticides. Um, but uh, Ralph Noble and Michelle Fountain and their teams um, really initiated a, lot, initiated a lot of this work. So Ralph was doing all the initial bioassays in the lab with Andrea, um, Michelle Fountain and her team, shout out to Adam doing those trials uh, and Beth counting all those SWD. Um, Richard Harden helpfully found us at Berry Garden Growers to do the field trial and for my own team, Cody and Imros back at Russell IPM. So many thanks to everybody and Innovate UK. And do you have any questions? Thank you, Claire. Um, that's very helpful. Yeah, there's a couple of things that we need to just clarify. Um, one is, which is the, the thorn in the flesh, I suppose, with all of this. Um, this this type of use is not cannot be used with EMU or emergency authorizations, I think is correct to say. Can you just, can you just ah. uh, that? Okay, so it's not- it can, be used, it can be used with fully authorized products, but not EMU or emergency authorization. Ah, if it was, so if, I might have done a mistake there with the EMU there, because I think I had it, that you could use it with EMU. Yeah, it, it is with a fully recommended- Fully authorized. Fully authorized. So authorized I apologize if I made a mistake there. I thought it could be. Okay. So, but yeah, not for off label. So, which of course does mean at the moment with ch Tracer on Cherry, um, then it couldn't be used with an emergency authorization. EMU, I think it is. I'm just getting from the, the uh, chat facility. We've got a helpful comment there saying that it can be used with an EMU, but not with an emergency authorization. So, in other words, on Cherry, Tracer, and XRL are still emergency authorizations. So we couldn't use right, problems yeah. with those. Just want to clarify that because this is a tree fruit audience. And uh, so we, I'm, I'm, top, I'm focusing on Cherry today. Um, it, uh, it, the, the AHDB, uh, what it's soon to become Horticultural Crop Protection Team, they are doing all they can to secure an EMU authorization for tracer on cherry but at the moment we haven't got it so if we get an emu then as an article 51 then we would be able to use it with that but not with an emergency authorization so just wanted to clarify that yeah so yes yeah, so I'm, I'm obviously we wish the the trials that we did were strawberry and raspberry so yeah. of course we were yeah. on the tracer and then yes. so yeah yeah i just want to clarify that for for the tree fruit growers the um the other point and, and this is a question we're often asked is um does reducing the use or, or the volume of active ingredient not increase the risk of um, resistance developing? So I, I, I know you've answered that question lots of times before, and I think also... Yeah. Well, that's... So, yeah, no, no, I'd like, very much like to answer that question. So there's, I think there's two issues here, but because you're actually, you're reducing the volume and the active, 
So if I were to use, I know we're saying we tested at 4%, which, you know, we're trying to look for something that's as cheap as for growers and equally effective. But so if, so there's two, there's several drivers for resistance management, but if you kill, if the kill rate's the same, you're going to get a, the same resistance pressure in a way, because, you know, the population dry, is uh, breeds up from what survives. But the second point is equally important is that if you use a band treatment, so the band treatment of an 8% spray, so we were saying four, but you could use eight, that's actually the same concentration of insecticide. So it's eight, it, you know, that's um, 0.4 mils per litre, for example, where, and the full spray is also 0.4 mils per litre. So it's actually the same concentration of active so if the insect was hit by that, it would have exactly the same resistance pressure because it's the same dose. Yeah, I, I think the other thing to add, which we've said before as well, is we're not actually trying to spray the insects with this band spray. We're, we're spraying the band spray onto the leaves and, the, and it's the probands which is attracting the insect to feed on the insecticide, which it ingests and it kills it. So we're not actually we're doing a, a broadcast spray here to, to kill all the insects. So that's, I think that's the other crucial point. Um, anything else you want to add to that, Claire? No, no, I think you're exactly right there, Scott. But even, but you know, you're, you're bound to hit some, but if you use, say, the 8% spray, which is still kind of like a massive saving. So, you know, I worked out for, for one pesticide and it was the full rate was going to cost about 80 quid. If you did eight per hectare, if you did the 8%, it's going to work out at 46 quid. And we're, we're recommending lower because it works, but but that if you use that 8%, that's exactly the same spray concentration. So if you hit it with that, you get exactly the same resistance pressure also because you're killing the same percentage of insects. So uh, ultimately the pressure, the resistance pressure is the same. Yeah. Claire, thank you. We're going to have to move on. We're running slightly over. Thank you so much for sharing Thanks that. So much. Um, there is lots of discussion going on in the chat room, so you might want to have a look at that, Claire, and others uh, who are interested uh, can look at the conversations that have been had with various, and Michelle Fountain's put in a few useful comments as well. So we're going to move on, but we're actually, we're moving on speaker to Beth and Shaw, but we're staying with the same subject because, of course, what these bait sprays of uh, this bait spray research has done is it's created uh, more questions about suitability for use with non-target insects and you know is there damage or or, or is there a deleterious effect to those so we have been funding or sorry not we but AHDB has funded and the worshipful company fruiters has funded some work on this so I'm going to ask if you want to stop sharing now Claire and uh, switch your video off and I'll ask my colleague Arunamat to upload the presentation from Beth and Shaw. Now, Beth and Shaw hey, left Naya back in November, but she kindly put this presentation to, together before she left to give us an update, bearing in mind this was at the end of November. So this does give you an update at that point uh, on the impact of SWD bait sprays on beneficial insects. So let's go with that. If you want to hit the start button, thanks Arunamat. Hi everybody, I'm sorry I'm not there to give this talk uh, in person, but if you do have any questions that arise from the work that I'm going to present, please feel free to ask uh, Michelle Fountain or Adam Walker, who should be in the audience uh, listening. Um, I believe that my talk is following on from that of Claire Sampson's, who's been discussing the work um, on probands, which is a new adjuvant to be combined with plant protection products to control spotted winged Drosophila. Uh, and hopefully she's introduced to you how effective that approach is in controlling spotted winged Drosophila in soft, soft and stone fruits. Um, the work I'm going to be presenting follows on really nicely from, from the bait spray work, because one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, what is the impact of these bait sprays uh, on non-target insects and beneficial insects. So we know that by combining the feeding baits with the plant protection products, we're attracting spotted wing Drosophila to feeding on those droplets, and that's what causes uh, their mortality. 
but so far very little has been done to look at the impacts on non-target organisms which may also be attracted to those bait sprays. So the work that I'm going to be presenting um, comes from two research projects one of which is funded by the Worshipful Company of Fruiterers, which is a laboratory-based um, a laboratory-based trial <clears throat> looking at the mortality of non-target organisms when exposed to uh, bait sprays. And the second part of the work is from some observations from the AHDB-funded uh, raspberry spray trial that was conducted this summer at a grower site. So to start with the uh, Worshipful Company project, this was conducted in the lab and we found six non-target species that were going to be of interest to look and see what their impacts of the bait sprays were on their mortality. And the species that we identified were a combination of uh, predators, pollinators and other non-target insects which could be classed as pests. So the species we went for, for were ladybird larvae, um, lacewing larvae, earwigs, hoverfly larvae, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, and uh, the predatory bug aureus. And what we did was we exposed these uh, organisms to different treatments, which were either combinations of the plant protection product Spinosad on its own, Spinosad combined with Combi Protect, which is the uh, current commercial adjuvant, Combi Protect on its own, Probands, which is the new um, the new adjuvant that Russell IPM have, have marketed, or a water control. And the image that you can see on the right hand side of the screen is just a schematic of the setup. So the organisms were offered a sugar water uh, and a food source, but then they were also offered the different treatments as droplets on um, on blackberry leaves. And what we did was we recorded the mortality of those organisms over time uh, from permanent exposure with, with the treatments. This image is just uh, the setup of the ladybird larvae bioassay and you can see the tiny little ladybird larvae sat on one of the, the sugar feeders on the right hand side of the screen. We also had these um, uh, filter papers in the bottom of the arenas to keep humidity um, at a reasonable level so that the insects didn't dry out um, from natural desiccation. <clears throat> so for the results, these two first results are for earwigs on the left hand side of the screen and for um, hoverfly larvae on the right hand side of the screen. And what we're looking at on the X axis, the upright one, <laughs> is the mean um, mean number of dead individuals. <clears throat> so for both graphs, the red bar are the um, spinosad at 50% label rate on its own, and the gray bar are 50% 50, 50 of field rate spinosad combined with combi protect. And what you can see in both of these figures is that the red bar and the gray bar follow a very similar trend throughout the assessment periods. And it's worth saying that the duration of the um, assessments change depending on the organism and what we know to be the like, natural mortality um, in a control situation. We know that earwigs are a very long living insect anyway, um, whereas things like uh, the hoverfly larvae and some of the other organisms that we'll talk about in a second, they don't survive as long in, in these artificial conditions. But what is really reassuring is that the um, Combi Protect bait on its own and the ProBans bait, which on these figures is the coded bait, they have a very similar mortality as the water alone treatment, showing that the baits themselves are not toxic to, do, to these two insects. Also, the fact that the red and the grey bars follow a very similar trend shows that it doesn't appear that the addition of the, um, the bait increases the rates of mortality. The statistical analysis hasn't yet been performed for um, for this data. So at the moment, all we can see is the trends, but this is quite a reassuring start to, to the results. 
Moving on to the lacewing larvae, which is the left-hand side of the screen, and the ladybird larvae, which is the right-hand side of the screen, we see quite different trends to um, the first two examples just shown. And what you'll see here is that the, the treatments themselves are very, they follow a very similar trend to one another. Um, so for this, it appears that the spinosad alone and the spinosad combined with combi protect doesn't increase mortality in comparison to the untreated control which is the water the green bar or the bait treatments alone so it appears that these two individual species aren't actually uh, attracted to the bait um with or without sorry they're not attracted to the bait with um with spinosad showing that in the field they probably wouldn't be inclined to, to feed on it even if it was applied to the crops that they were in. So for the aureus we see a slightly different um, set of results and what you'll notice here is that we ha actually have much higher mortality in the combi protect combined with the 50% spinosad treatment. And it's quite a lot higher than that of the spinosad alone, which is clustered more with the water control and the two baits without the plant protection product. So for aureus in particular, it appears that they are actually attracted to feeding on those droplets of the bait combined with the plant protection product. This isn't obviously a, a great result because um, unlike the other species that didn't show any major preference to the bait plus spinosad over the, the spinosad treatments alone, it does mean that they're actively seeking out the plant protection product where it is combined with this feeding stimulant. That doesn't necessarily mean that this translates to what happens in the field. While we were offering alternative food sources and water sources, the lab setup is very artificial. So we still take these results with a pinch of salt and it also needs to be transferred into the field which leads us quite nicely on to the work that we did in the AHDB project. So for the AHDB field trial, which was um, a bait spray, bait spray trial set up in a commercial raspberry crop, we also took measurements of non-targets, beneficials and predators through observations, which were uh, technical staff walking through the plots for a timed period and noting down the number of visits that they saw from various different species. We also looked at tap samples in the plots to see what non-targets and beneficials were in the different plots and looked to see if there's any difference between the treatments themselves. And this data has actually been analysed. So for the screen at the moment, you can see the bumblebee results. And the two figures on the right hand side are the two different observation assessment dates. And what we actually found was that there was no significant difference in the number of observations of bumblebees between the treatments. These treatments aren't exactly the same as the treatments that were in the laboratory trial. But what we do have here is the, um, the Combi Protect 50%, which is the blue bars. That is the equivalent of what we have in the, uh, in the lab trial. Um, the, Positive control actually in this trial is full field rate foliar applications of plant protection products. So that's what growers would be applying to the crops themselves. Um, but as I say, we found no significant difference in the number of bumblebees that were observed in any of the plots. We also have a very similar story for honeybees in that we found no variation in observations between the treatments. So it doesn't appear that the, the, the um, bait sprays with or without pesticides had any impact on attracting the number of beneficial organisms to those particular plots. Uh, moving on to the tap samples, here we recorded any insect of interest which ranged from, like you can see on the screen at the moment, aureus, uh, parasitic wasps, spiders, um, we were also looking for uh, mites that were introduced as well. But for these three species that are on the screen at the moment, we found no significant difference between tap samples um, in the different treatments. 
In the field, we also wanted to look at um, any impacts it had on other pest species because we didn't want to encourage other uh, pests with the treatments that we were using. But for things like capsid and ligus, we found there was no significant difference in the numbers between treatments. We did actually find higher aphid numbers in the 50% um, plant protection product treatment. So this is 50% of the field rate that would be applied as an aerial application. We actually found higher aphid numbers in one of the assessments compared to the full foliar, full foliar application rate uh, in the positive control. So it appears that 50% of the plant protection product isn't enough to control the aphid populations in these settings. But it's worth saying that in the 50% um, the plant protection product with Combi Protect, we found no significant increase in the number of aphids. But other insects, uh, we found there was no significant difference in the number of ants between the treatments. But we did find a higher number of uh, diptera in the ProBans treatment plus 4% of plant protection product. Um, only in one of the assessments, though, compared to the positive control. Diptera aren't necessarily regarded as a pest. Um, so it's not like we're particularly concerned about this result. It's just worth worth noting that it did appear to have higher numbers in the coded adjuvant treatment. So moving on to the summary of the results that I've just presented, we know that bait sprays are an effective way of controlling spotted drosophila, even at the low rates that are tested um, in the previous trials. And this will play a big part when it comes to looking at future approvals for plant protection products. We already think that there's going to be restrictions on the number of applications that can be made. So it's great to know that, that bait sprays could be used with much lower uh, amounts of active ingredient and still be as affected at controlling spotted wing drosophila. Earwigs and hoverfly larvae had similar mortality in the Combi Protect treatment with Spinosad compared to the Spinosad alone treatment, showing that in that particular uh, case, there's no negative impact on these species of combining the, the bait with, um, with the insecticide. Ladybird and lacewing larvae seem not to be impacted by any of the treatments, showing that they're not really bothered about feeding on the feeding baits. Uh, but unfortunately, only Aurea showed an increase in mortality where we've combined the Combi Protect with Spinosad compared to Spinosad alone. But as we said, the laboratory setup is quite artificial, so there's no necess there's no real evidence to show that that would translate to uh, to the same results in the field where Aureus would have access to other prey species, um, such as thrips. In the field trial, there was no significant difference in honeybee or bumblebee observations, and no significant difference in uh, the numbers of anthocorids, parasitic wasps, spiders, capsids, or ants. Uh, the only significant difference of point in the field trial was that we did find higher diptera in the coded adjuvant plus four percent plant protection product but as we've said this doesn't necessarily have a negative connotation and um, so finally i just want to thank you all for listening um and to the funding bodies that have supported this work also berry gardens russell ipm and microbiotech that have been involved in both of these projects in one way or another um, as I say, I'm not there to answer the questions myself, but please do ask uh, Michelle Fountain or Adam Walker. And thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you to Bethan for doing that. Um, we are running a bit late, but I just wanted to bring in Michelle Fountain because there's been a lot of discussion going on in the chat room. One specific question, uh, Michelle, uh, saying, is there anything identifying why Aureus may be more attracted to the bait compared to the other non-target species? Perhaps you can just clarify that for us. Um, I think we're, you might have seen my earlier comments that we are actually rerunning that. We're not um, sure that that's a, a very reliable result, but we're going to run it for longer because that test only ran for 24 hours, as you would see. But we know that um, aureus are attracted to flowers and they do feed on nectar and pollen. 
So it might be that there's something about the adjuvant that is similar to nectar and pollen, and that's why it's feeding on it. But that's why I said in the chat, don't take that as the final result because we're rerunning that experiment and we'll report that towards the end of June. Perfect. Lovely. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, yeah, we, we must move on. But before finally, before doing that, I just wanted to say that uh, there's obviously continuing work going on by the horticulture crop protection team at AHDB to secure emergency authorizations again for Tracer and XRL on plum and cherry for this coming year. Um, it gets harder and harder every year. Thank you to all the industry members who have supplied usage data from 2022 and, and also again from the previous year, 2021. Without that, we wouldn't have the emergency authorization. We've had to jump through more hoops again this year. It is getting more difficult, uh, hence the continual need to look for alternatives. Um, one very, very good alternative is the use of something called sterile insect technique. And I'd like to invite Glenn Slade from Big Sis to come and tell us the latest results that he's been getting with his team uh, looking just at this thing, sterile insect technique. Good afternoon, Glenn. Can you hear us okay, Glenn? Yeah. Hi, <laughs> I was on mute, sorry. Um, thanks for the intro, Scott, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, Glenn Slade, founder and CEO of Big Sis. We're all about uh, chemical-free uh, insect control. If I can just get this get started. Sorry, one second. From the beginning, I think that'll work. That's it. Um, and I'm going to tell you about our solution, which, as Scott says, is based on the sterile insect technique. I think a lot of you have heard presentations from me before, but I will go through very quickly what SIT is about. Um, for those who may not be familiar with it. Um, what we're doing is producing lots of sterile male insects that we can release in the field to mate with wild females, SWD in this case, who then have no offspring. Um, and this is something that's been around for over 60 years. It's been used for various different species. So it's very much a platform technology. And one thing that's notable about it um, is that it's particularly effective against low pest infestations and that's because the males we're releasing can harness their biological instinct to track down those wild females um, and that means it can be well used as a preventative application and the schematic chart is showing the idea of releasing sterile males every week from early in the season to stop the pest infestation ever building up and so it's a different approach to something like chemical insecticides, where they tend not to be used until the pest infestation reaches a threshold uh, to make them economical. Um, and of course, that means that there's a bigger yield loss using chemicals. So SIT actually outperforms chemicals, both in efficacy and the duration of that. And that, that's why I'm a big fan of it. Um, and on top of the efficacy story, it's a great sustainability story. So sterile insect technique is, of course, species specific. Um, there's no toxins involved in a sterile insects they can't establish in the environment. And in the particular case of Big Sis uh, SIT, um, we use native strains. So we use English SWD uh, for our SWD control, and obviously those are non-GMO. Um, and this great safety profile means we've actually already got approval to sell without a, needing a permit in England and some other jurisdictions. So we're getting very quickly to market. Before I say more about that, just one more point about SIT. Um, as you may know, historically, it's been used in some very big, large area projects, you, you know, things like Medfly, New World Screwworm. Um, but it's only stayed at that big scale because it's been uneconomical to, to bring down to a small scale that could be used commercially. Um, and it's been government programs, industry funded programs that have been able to justify those cost bases. So what Bixis is doing is reimagining sterile insect technique, primarily by using automation to rear insects individually. You can see one in a little pot there. Um, and that means we can uh, get the cost of doing SIT down uh, for local users. Um, but also we're offering this as a farm scale service. So we offer season long control of the pest species, in this case, SWD, 
um, we're not relying on the grower to release the sterile insects. Now, SWD, as you know, has been a big challenge for growers for getting on for a decade now, and it's not getting any easier. Um, and the AHDB put the cost of controlling SWD at up to £11,000 per hectare. Some of those, like the ones on the left, are cash costs, chemical insecticides, replacing the biocontrols that those insecticides kill, and more trapping. Um, but actually, the real cost of SWD for most growers is additional labour. Um, it's that meticulous hygiene in the polytunnels. It's upping the frequency of picking um, to be sure that larvae counts aren't going to go up because, of course, there is the, the, the nightmare spectre of rejected produce if you don't get it right. Now, in 2021, um, Big Sis was the world first company to do a field trial to show that sterile insect technique works against SWD, which you'd expect because it works against so many species. But um, of course, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Um, and what we showed in this uh, trial, which has been published in the um, journal Insects, uh, is shown in this chart. That the y-axis is wild females per trap on a three-week moving average. Um, this is a 7.4 hectare uh, Everbearer strawberry plot. Um, the trial was done in partnership with Berry Gardens and NIAB. Um, and basically from July, August, we can see a separation from the treated site, which continued to flatline throughout the season. Um, obviously, there's always some SWD there because it's an invasive pest. But when you compare that to the plots that did not get uh, the sterile insects being released, um, there's a very large and significant difference. So it was a 91% suppression uh, versus one of those plots, 71% versus the other. And what's really interesting is at the end of the season when insecticides were applied to the control plots, it didn't make that much difference. Um, and, you know, that's that's been a recurring story I've heard um, in the industry. Um, there was an insecticide application to the treated site um, for aphids in, in the middle of August. So that's why we've measured our headline reduction in mid-August. Um, but obviously it gave pretty clear indication that SIT can be a key to tackle uh, SWD going forwards. So to explain a bit about our journey from going forwards from there, before we look at the 2022 work, um, what we've been doing in 2021 and 2022 is actually bringing forward our data by relying on manual rearing, which is obviously very expensive, having a, an army of people sorting males from females, as well as the other tasks of rearing and sterilizing insects. Um, and what we're doing as we speak is transitioning towards our automated sterile male production, which is not just cheaper, um, but also very scalable because we just have to replicate. We just have to put more of those individual pots through the system to get uh, more sterile males out. And that's gonna be the basis of our um, commercial projects in 2023. I'll say more about that in a second. But in 2022, we were still dependent on manual rearing. And what we had planned um, was to produce rough, more, more than twice as many sterile males per week. So the blue line is what we released in 2021. The gray line is what we planned to release in 2022. So it would have been you know, more than double the hectares as well as some field coach trials. But unfortunately, we had a very challenging season for rearing SWD manually. Um, and that means we only had four hectares where we were able to keep season long releases. Um, and we did manage to do our field coach trials. So that was a bit disappointing, but we did get a lot of extra information as we went through. And I'll now run you through that. First of all, let me just quickly show you the strawberries. So we could only start treat this up until about the start of July. The top chart for 2021 is an extract from the chart you saw earlier where we um, successfully suppressed the SWD all season. In 2022, we started very well. You'll see that the season started earlier. It was a lot warmer in April and May. So we had SWD showing up on our control site um, before, well, in June. 
and had good control. But sort of the corollary of uh, release, sterile male releases controlling SWD, when we stopped releasing, um, the infestation went up. And it shows that the two sites were pretty much comparable, actually. So we, it was a fair comparison uh, when we were claiming that we had suppressed relative to control. Um, next uh, example is on raspberries. Um, this is from a field cage study. Uh, here we're measuring mean larvae per fruit. Now, this wasn't a commercial harvesting. It was harvested once per week as a total harvest. And here we can see the untreated plot um, getting the highest number of larvae per fruit. Uh, our low dose treatment, uh, and this legend here uh, is five sterile males to one wild male and one wild female being released each week. Um, that gave a good suppression result throughout the season, as we had hoped for. Um, biology being biology, our higher dose gave a slightly concerning result in the first few weeks of higher pressure. This was 25 to 1. But what we did here was the same thing we do in the field when we get um, a hot spot of wild SWD. We upped the release rate of sterile males and brought things back under control. Um, so we kept that under control for the high dose as well. Um, and then the season long study was on blackberries. Um, it was only four hectares. Um, this had been a field that was very difficult to control in 2021. Um, a mix of overwinter and long cane. It was within a larger block. So you know, there were tunnels adjacent to the ones we were trying to treat. Um, and there was some netting in, in use um, as part of that growers uh, protocol. Um, and we did manage to keep our sterile males uh, being released all season, despite those production challenges I mentioned. The, the full data is confidential, but what I can say is that it was very clear suppression right through to late August and even in September, October, when things picked up a bit, um, there was much lower pressure than control. I'm very excited that in 2023, what we'll be doing is treating the whole field. That'll be about 22 hectares. So we'll be able to manage that invasion pressure on the borders uh, much better. And I'm sure we'll get a great season long result again this year. Um, so just to sum up some of the 2022 insights where we had the sterile swd we got great control as we would have expected um, we've seen different dynamics now on raspberries uh, and blackberries as well as strawberries um, in 2023 we are having a minimum size of seven hectares for our plots because the border effects um, can, can be a challenge um, i hope that in due course we'll reduce that minimum size a bit further but we want to play it safe this year um, and since SWD is, is invasive, we want to make sure that we've definitely got enough field to be able to see a clear suppression effect um, in, in the treated area. Um, and the other thing we've seen, which is you know, a part of the reality of this protocol, is that we can only not release for a week, at the, maybe two weeks at the most, before SWD will break through, because obviously it can reproduce very, very quickly. Um, in the summer months especially, um, and because we're working as a preventative measure, if the SWD goes up by a factor of 10, we'd have to release at least a factor of 10 more insects to, to try and get back on top. And as we've seen, even chemical sprays struggle to bring it back under control in conjunction with SIT. So as we're going into 2023 then, our focus is very much on getting production scaled up. Um, a photo there, in fact, of our version one, pilot line uh, for automated production. We've now got something that's much more compact and slick and um, ramping up rapidly to be able to deliver uh, this season's projects. Um, it's a very unique production system. I'll just tell you quickly about it because we've got these very lightweight capsules. They measure roughly one centimeter by two centimeters that grow the insects. Um, and it's really about a high throughput of very simple operations with those capsules to spit out um, our target of millions of sterile male SWD per week, so we can treat hundreds of hectares. Um, and we'll be using a micro factory model. So as we um, build from this uh, factory, we'll then be replicating that factory rather than seeking to build a giant global factory in the future. Last couple of slides, just to wrap up, um, just to recap that we deliver 
our season long control of SWD as a service. We don't just produce flies in our MPU, which means micro production unit. We also contract the staff to take them to the field and release them according to our dynamic maps and collect um, traps back so that we know where to make the next release. Um, we believe that's great for growers because they don't need to worry about extra labor or a learning curve about how to deploy this method. Um, and we keep them posted with reports on how SWD is looking in the field, just in case another intervention is appropriate. Um, we want this to be widely available in the market. So we'll be having a multi-channel distribution approach up until now. Uh, we've just been um, booking in Berry Gardens growers for 2023. I'm hoping that we will have some limited additional capacity, um, which we'll be announcing in a month or so's time. Um, and working with the main distributors as well as Berry Gardens to get that available to growers. And that's where I'm going to end. Thank you very much for your attention. Happy to take Thank you. Thank you very questions. much, Glenn. Thank you. And uh, we, we again, we're running slightly over. Uh, just a couple of questions come up. What does the cost comparison for farmers look like using regularly timed release of sit compared to chemical treatment and yield losses? And how quickly can you estimate you may change the scale up? So lots of questions there. Yeah, there are. So we haven't announced our formal price for um, the season long control yet. Um, as a, as a very rough number, it's going to be around £2,000 per hectare. Um, that is obviously more than chemical treatments, but of course, chemical treatments don't work. And as for yield losses, we're building the case studies to, to demonstrate that that is worth the effort. Um, and I think that's not only in terms of less fruit damage. Um, what I'm hearing more and more from growers is it's also the opportunity to leave fruit longer on uh, the plant so it can grow more uh, and therefore weigh more. Uh, okay, and uh, one other question is, do uh, do you envisage doing any work on cherries? Have you done any work on cherries? Have I missed that? Yeah, we did a very small um, plot in 2022, but um, unfortunately because of the production challenges, it wasn't really um, a, a clear result. So we will be on, we are on cherries right now. In fact, we are aiming to do our first release of cherries on cherries um, in a couple of weeks time for 2023. Um, and what we'll be aiming to do is try and get the SWD population under control during flowering so that we've got a head start before we get into the fruiting part of the season. Um, but we're working on that proactively with a couple of growers um, this year. Thank you, Glenn. If you could just have a quick look on the chat there, there are one or two other questions that you might want to answer directly, but um, given time is short, we'll move on. Thank you, Glenn, for helping out and uh, joining us again this afternoon. So, Thanks, Scott. Okay, so that takes us to our final talk of the day. Still staying with Spotted Winged Sofla, Adam Walker, another of Michelle Fountain's team at NIAB at East Malling, is joining us again. Adam is probably known to many of you because he's made presentations before at this event. Uh, and Adam's going to be sharing some of the latest research that we've been doing on Spotted Wing Drosophila population management and monitoring. Good afternoon, Adam. Hello, Scott. Can you hear me okay? We can see you and hear you perfectly well. If you want to share your presentation with us. Okay, you should be able to see it now. Yep, that's good. You want to hit the slideshow? Okay, set on full screen. Perfect, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about using precision monitoring to control Drosophila Suzuki and where best to place precision monitoring traps to optimise control. So for the last 10 years, um, staff at NIAB East Malling have been monitoring D. Suzuki populations in soft fruit crops and neighbouring woodlands and hedgerows. And what our trap catches show is in late autumn time, D. Suzuki migrate from the soft fruit crops into neighbouring woodlands where they overwinter. Then in the springtime, when the temperatures increase, the D. Suzuki become more active before migrating back into the soft fruit crop during the growing season. So using this information, we hypothesised that if we put precision monitoring traps in woodlands neighbouring soft fruit crops at the right density before this autumn influx, we should be able to catch these D. Suzuki, reduce down the population before they overwinter. Then if these traps remain in place during the winter time and into spring, they should 
catch the Dizuki as they become active in warmer temperatures and reduce them further still. So by the time the growing season starts, there should be fewer Dizuki migrating into the neighboring soft root crop. And those lower numbers should be easier to control by other methods, including the sterile insect technique, as we've just seen. So in October 2019, we set up the precision monitoring trial on six soft root farms in southern England. The farms were selected because they had two small isolated pockets of woodland next to a different soft root crop. One of these woodlands was designated a treated woodland into which we deposited 64 precision monitoring traps spaced at eight metre intervals and one metre height. In the other woodland, we put no precision monitoring traps to act as an untreated control. To monitor the impact of precision monitoring on the D Suzuki population, we use small monitoring traps shown in the picture on the top right. These monitoring traps were positioned where the green fill circles are on the diagram. And we had one in each woodland and one in their neighboring soft root crop. The traps were filtered at regular intervals during the trial and replaced. And we counted the numbers of male and female D Suzuki in these traps to look at the impact that precision monitoring was having on the D Suzuki numbers. So this graph here shows the overall impact that precision monitoring was having. On the vertical axis, you've got mean D Suzuki per small monitoring trap. And on the horizontal axis, it's got the different trap positions. So first of all, I'll draw your attention to the left and right hand side of the graph. On the left hand side, we've got the trap catches in the woodlands and on the right hand side, we've got the catches in the neighboring crops. And what you can see is significantly more D Suzuki were caught in the woodlands compared to the neighboring crops. Now looking at left and right hand side respectively, what we can see is where we've got precision monitoring, that's the treated woodland and the treated crop. We, we got about a 50% reduction of D Suzuki um, compared to the control equivalents. This difference was not statistically significant, but this is probably due to large variations in D Suzuki numbers between the different farms where we did the study. Now, importantly, with precision monitoring, we want to see if we're reducing down the free flying females, because these are the ones that are potentially going to migrate into the neighboring crop and lay their eggs in the fruit. So this graph gives that information. The vertical axis is mean female D Suzuki per small monitoring trap on a log 10 scale. So this is so you can see the detail in catches at the high end and also at the low end on the same graph. The full black line are catches in the control woodlands and crops and the dash black line are the catches in the treated woodlands and crops. And what you can see, most assessments, we got fewer free flying female catches in the treated woodlands and crops compared to the control equivalent. And the impact was felt biggest in the springtime where we got significant reductions in the treated woodlands and crops compared to the control as indicated by the asterisks on the graph. Now, something we noticed during the trial is that some traps catch more D Suzuki consistently than other ones. And we wanted to know what factors influence this because knowing this information will help us instruct farmers where to position their precision monitoring traps to optimize control using this technique. Now we know that D Suzuki, as well as cultivated fruit, they also use a number of wild hosts. So what we did as one of the assessments was a habitat scoring assessment, whereby we assessed the habitat in a four meter radius of every trap, and we scored it according to how suitable it is for D Suzuki, and also how abundant it is in that area. We did this for all 64 traps at all six woodlands in summer, autumn and winter. And then we correlated this information with the catches of D Suzuki in the corresponding traps. And what we found was two significant positive correlations. First of all, in the summer, we found as bramble coverage increases, we get a significant increase in male D Suzuki catches. Then again, in autumn time, this switches to ivy, but it's the same effect. 
when IV coverage increases, we get a significant increase in male DC-seeking catches. We've also looked at the trap position in the grid in the precision monitoring woodland. And what we found here is perimeter traps nearest the crop catch significantly more D Suzuki throughout the trial compared to the other perimeter traps indicated on the diagram on the left and the non-perimeter traps too. So to conclude, what we found is permanently located precision monitoring traps in woodlands reduce the numbers of overwintering D Suzuki. And this effect is shown most notably in woodlands and neighbouring crops the following spring. And importantly, it's reducing down the D Suzuki females, which start to migrate into the neighbouring crop attracted by volatiles early in the growing season. And this is a good opportunity for the sterile insect technique, as shown by Glenn, of which um, works effectively, but also on low numbers of D Suzuki. So it will be easier to over flood a lower population of female D Suzuki with your sterile males during this period. We've also found that habitat type impacts the numbers of D Suzuki in the traps. And in this study, um, bramble and ivy were most notable to have significant positive impacts on the numbers of D Suzuki caught in the respective traps. So those would be places to focus those traps. And we also found traps on the perimeter of the woodland nearest to the soft root crop catch significantly more D Suzuki. So using this information, we hope that growers can optimize their D Suzuki catches by placing the traps in the correct habitats at the correct times of year. I'd like to say thank you for listening. And also thank you to the AHDB and for the growers for supporting this trial. Any questions? Thank you, Adam. Uh, very helpful, very clear and concise. Um, I just want to sort of pick up on this the bramble and ivy bit because um, I'm slightly confused by that. Um, usually we find, if you imagine that what we found with cherries over the years, that uh, cherries are more attractive than the traps are in the spring due to the... Uh, the, the nectaries. Um, do we assume that if they're attracted into the traps in the bramble and ivy areas, that, that actually the traps are more attractive than the bramble or ivy, or are we assuming that they're, we're catching more there because the populations are much higher because they're being attracted to the, the ivy and the bramble? Makes sense. I think um, so. In those areas, it, I think, A, they're going to be attracting a large number of D Suzuki. And there's no spraying going on there anyway. So the D Suzuki are, are kind of allowed to increase in their numbers there. So any trap there is going to catch those free flying ones. Um, so I think that might be having an impact. But I think it's also the timing of when we did it. So if we did it, say, um, in the summer before ripening of the blackberry, then you can um, expect the traps to be more attractive. And the same thing with ivy in the winter which is possible as well. But I think we'd need to investigate that further. In it. Okay, so what you're saying is they are being drawn in because of the ivy and the, the brambles. Uh, and, and, and a related question to that from uh, what's one of our delegates, does it matter whether the bramble and ivy are actually fruiting at the time? Well, we just took a snapshot because we did this at one time during the summer and one time during the autumn. So I think a more detailed study and um, throughout that, those respective periods would be needed. Okay. Uh, and a slightly related question also, interested to see that the traps around the perimeter are, are, are catching more. Why do we think that is? Is it because they're, they're moving from the crop into the, um, the perimeter area and they, that's the first area they come to at the end of the season? I think there would be a bit of that because the so most of those trap catches are influenced um, by the late autumn catches. And that's the period where the cultivated fruit is fading and the wild fruit is fading. Um, this is the kind of migratory period. So they might be the kind of frontline traps that you would expect them to encounter. Um, but also these. Um, on the perimeter of woodlands, you get a lot of bramble because there's less um, woodland yeah. canopy. Yeah. Um, so it's quite possible when that's fading, um, the D Suzuki are um, attracted more to the traps. Okay, uh, and just to, to add, uh, Michelle's put, Michelle Fountain's put a useful comment in. 
the chat, bramble and ivy provide more than nectar, pollen and eggling sites, they provide shelter. It is likely that the leaf volatiles are also attractive, as shown in previous research by other scientists. So thank you, Michelle. Um, I think everyone's getting tired. Uh, you all, you've picked a, the, a difficult time of day, Adam, but uh, you've certainly kept me awake. Thank you. For, uh, thank you for your good presentation, which brings us to the end of today's event. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen one more time, uh, if I may, um, and I'm going to move on to, if I can. Okay, so just to, to, to say a few words uh, in, in wrapping up. First of all, I'd like to thank all our presenters uh, today. There have been a lot of talks, 17, I think, in total, um, some of whom weren't able to join us, but uh, we managed to we managed to listen to their pre-recorded presentations. So thank you for all them for 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 doing that. Um, a huge amount of time, thought, and energy has gone into these presentations. So thank you to to you all. Um, if you